Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing marvelously well. I do hope you're staying safe, happy, and above all, healthy. We have been very blessed to be able to do a lot of free courses for you over the last couple of months during this lockdown. There's two courses of mine that's come out. There's a mixing in the box one where I mixed a track over about six and a half hours that you can watch and, and download the multi-tracks. There's one I did with Pete Morose, which is a singer-songwriter one. We had Tony Franklin, the great Tony Franklin, who of course was in the firm with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. He did a course. Bradwood, the amazing Bradwood, did a mixed course with us, where I also did some mixing as well. And last, but definitely no means least, Mr. Matt Starr did a full drum recording course as well. All of those are listed below. But today, I am very, very excited to announce that we have a free course from Mr. Mark Daniel Nelson. Mark Daniel Nelson is incredibly talented. As a producer, engineer, and mixer, Mark has worked with Fleetwood Mac, Colby Calais, Eric Burden, and many, many more. He's ridiculously talented and a really genuinely great guy. He's also very successful in film and TV. He's mixed tons of huge movies and done tons of TV shows. Just really, really talented. And as an instrumentalist and a composer himself. He has given us this course for free for you to watch. The only thing we ask is if you can, if, if you are able, please send a donation to Music Cares. Music Cares is something that's very dear to my heart and dear to very many people. Music Cares helps people, musicians, engineers, producers, mixers who have fallen upon hard times. Again, if you're not in a financial situation to be able to donate, totally understand. But if you can, please donate whatever you can. The link is below. So the course from Mark is Colby Calais' single Goldmine. This track was produced by the rather wonderful and extremely talented Mr. John Shanks. So this is a wonderful opportunity to see how Mark works and a great insight into Colby's music and how it was created and how it was mixed. So I'd really like to say thank you ever so much to Mark. Thank you for your generosity. And if, if you can, please donate to Music Cares. If you can't, I totally understand. In the meantime, please download any of the other multi-tracks and go and watch any of the other courses. Thank you ever so much. Stay safe, stay happy, and stay healthy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Daniel Nelson, deconstructing a mix for a Colby Calais song called Go Mine off of the Malibu Sessions album. This was produced by John Shanks, and I believe they rented a house on Malibu's beach and loaded a ton of gear in and just recorded the whole project there. At the time, Ken Calais and myself were working on this. We did about four or five songs on the record. And I wanted to go over my philosophy of mixing on my template and talk about the fact that I, I do usually do an in-the-box version and a summing version depending on the song. And today I have here my co-pilot Atticus and he's usually falling asleep within 15 minutes of the track. But the problem is he starts snoring, which he starts getting quite loud, so I just turn it out louder and louder to kind of drown him out. Okay, so when we were asked to do this, we were at a studio that had an AWS, and at that time I was still kind of really jumping in and putting a lot of effort into mixing in the box, and I was finding that it was really starting to really work. And at the time, my template was a little more simple than what it is in this session. We expanded it recently. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. So here, give you a little breakout. So in my session, I always group my drums and percussion slash any kind of element in a separate bus. So pretend like this is all in the box as, as of right now. Everything is grouped literally for drums, literally for percussion, and then they're sending to their own stereo bus. So I have it mapped where all of my buses are in line at the very end of the session. Colors are important, obviously, but the biggest thing that I need to see is that it's together. Some people like to put it after the groups, and it's just hard to navigate for me. So basically, if I can look at this and I can see real quickly that I have drums, percussion, effects, and these all three are literally drum percussion 
effects, something that has transient sounding elements to it. Then it goes to bass, then acoustic guitar, guitar, keyboards, synthesizers, and then it breaks out to orchestra stuff because I do do a lot of film work that I've actually have woodwinds, brass, orchestra, always in my template. And then after that, it's background vocals, lead vocals. Now, the way this happens is today I have on this stuff, it was the drums were going into the digital bus. Everything is digital all the way down to the end. But I do have it molted. So the whole buses are dumping to the digital bus and they're also alting and molting to today the SSL Sigma. And on the council today, I have just as a reference printbacks, I have my SSL playback, the in the box version, which is the clone, same thing, the rough mix that I was given by uh, John Shanks, and the print, which was the print we ended up sending to Eric Boulanger at the bakery for mastering. Probably won't listen too much to that. But I wanted to go over a little bit about this process because it is important and I'm going to go between the two so you can actually hear the difference because it is pretty big difference even if I'm not using outboard hardware with it. Just the summing alone adds something that I actually like. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the drums. So with my drums, I, like I said, I always group the drums into their own buses and I always group the percussion or any kind of electronic element into its own effects or percussion bus. So today, the most of the percussion and the electronics goes into the effects bus. And then it goes down the line with the bass, the acoustic guitars, the electric guitars, keyboard synths usually group out to Colby's vocals and then to the background vocals, which is a lot. Um, Nelly Joy, Justin Young, Colby's fiance, uh, Jason Reeves are doing a lot of the background vocals for this track. Let's take a peek to the song. Let's hear the rough first and see where we're at. What I want to hear though is I want to know um, what they're kind of wanting to hear up in the front. Usually for me, I like to hear drums and vocals, and Colby Kelly track is always known for her voice being the center of it all. And so you have to kind of craft everything around that. And so listening to the rough, with the drums and stuff going, I can already tell you that it's, it feels kind of wadded up. Um, I want some more like sparkly stuff, you know, some more acoustics going around with the drums kind of pumping. I want the low end to be deeper and I want her to be front and center. Going back, I can tell you right away, I would start drums and then acoustic guitars and then bring in the bass guitar. So let's just take a peek at my drums and see what we got going on here. Now this is Victor and Drizzo on the drums and he clearly has played on more albums than you could even fathom. He's just the guy that gets amazing drum tones. And so they, I think, lugged him into a bedroom and they just kind of trapped him in this gated acoustic mecca and took tracks of it. But the cool thing about all of these things, they gave me so many options on the drum set, which we're gonna really go through. And I'm gonna mute a couple things, my snare sample and then my drum thing, so we can just hear what it's doing. But you're gonna hear that there's stuff like well sound, which is clearly they took something and ran it all the way across the house in probably the, the stairwell of the entryway, this big massive sound, it sounds like a well. And then there's dirty kit and all these other options that you can really blend in. And listening to the drum set, I'm gonna play it just as is right now. So right away, you can hear this thing called well. I mean, that sounds like it's, I don't know, 50 feet away in the completely different side of the house. But if you zoom in on the rooms, they're very processed and they sound really nice 
and crunchy. And that's the cool thing about Victor. He's he's kind of like he's always rolling through his 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 parts, and it just becomes like a wheel. So when you start crunching stuff up, it really kind of rolls in a very nice way. But like I said, if you solo just the overheads, super dead. But then you get your rooms, super crunchy. But then you can get even further into the well, which is the stairwell, and it sounds like it was in a garage or something. There's all these little things like the salt shaker mic, You just got every option you can think of. So when I'm doing drums, I'd like to do a kind of a vortex of all those sounds where you're gonna have the definition of the kick and snare in your face, but you're still gonna have the ticker tape kind of salt shaker, kind of crunchy rolling mic, but then you'd get your cannony kind of echo from the whale sound. So when you're putting it together without the samples, You're already seeing, you're getting a picture of what the drums are gonna sound like. If I just take out the room by itself and I go back and I say, okay, what did I do to this? When it came in, it sounded like this. So in reality, I can tell you it's probably tracked in the bedroom. The rooms were probably either in a hallway or in the bedroom with it. The thing I needed to hear is that rolling thing that I wanted to get out of it, which Victor does really well with his ghost notes, but I want it to sound, I don't know, more gritty and stuff. So I pulled up this really cool Klinghelm compressor. And the cool thing about this compressor is, I don't know if a lot of people are going after the limit mode, but the best part is on one, on the timing of one in the limit mode, you can really get it to do a Fairchild thing remarkably well. And if I go between the two, That's when it starts to sound like a wheel. The drums are starting to crush around. It just brings it out. It brings it out really cool. So combining that with the other well, you get all those little hi-hat accents that are just really important for the song. Okay, so I'm gonna pull in the set again. So this is without the snare sample. And I'm a sucker for snares, everyone knows that. Um, in fact, Ken is too, obviously. And we were trying to find the best kind of focus point because listening to the reference, the snare was cool, but it was kind of more about the, the, the ghost notes and stuff and the rolling. We wanted to find something that had more of an aggressive punch. So I found the snare sample, I ended up printing it, but it's on its own, it sounds a little aggressive, but when you blend it in, it's the piece. So let me, it's without the verb. And all I have here on the, on the EQ channel is just a little bit of low mid at 100. And that will give me, and it's just a, a smidgen of expander, just so it doesn't ring out. The sample that we had was kind of long and we wanted to cut it down. So the cool thing about this reverb though is if I go down to my drum reverb section. So on my bus, I have unbelievable amount of reverbs ready to go. And these guys are already kind of set. So some are already set to literally long. Some are set exactly. I have three or four plates that I know exactly the sound I want in my head, depending on the record I loved growing up or whatever, I kind of crafted these sounds off of that. The reverb for the drums is just an impulse from the 480, the Music Club C, and I use it almost on every drum set. The thing I liked about this one and the fact that Victor was playing in this rolling fashion, I wanted to kind of create kind of a, not electronic, but kind of a stylistic kind of moment movement of it. And I thought, okay, that's kind of 
doesn't really have a lot of life to it, but if I could create a gate on top of the reverb, which I have just following my reverb send, It's more humanized in the sense it's, it's random, that the gates are shutting down differently, and you can hear that in the track where it just kind of pulls and pushes, and it adds a little bit of element. So let's hear what the sample sounds like with the whole drum set. Without the reverb. So the toms on this, I also uh, sample because I wanted them to be really hard left and right and really punchy. So my toms here, I just printed, but if, if you listen by themselves, they sound almost like keyboards. There's not a lot of, a lot of life to them. It's one velocity hits. But if you put it in the track, it's another one of those things because there's so much movement going on that it actually creates its own interesting part. So here's with the toms in. Which is cool. So next we have the percussion and the electronic kit. So there's a lot of low end coming on this. I'm gonna go back in a second to the acoustic set. But I want to talk about what we have in the elements of percussion. And right now, it's pretty straightforward. We've got a four on the floor kick going. Let's see what we got. You know, just have a little bit. So I took, it looks like 250 out, and that was probably to make sure that the real one had some pump. So if we put the two. Yeah, so they're they're kind of feeling pockets. So together, here's the drum set with the electronics and the actual percussion. So you can still hear the actual snare and the ghosts going underneath it, but you get that force of the snare every time it hits on the snare. Same with the toms. And those create this like kind of definition of how the drums are gonna come out. And it kind of gives you both worlds where you got the actual vibe of the drum set and then actual really sustaining, punchy hits. Let's talk about the two bus. So on my drums, for the overall sound, I have a pretty simple setup. And it's usually one or two plugins. And this is what it's going into. So right now I just have a Poltec and that's just 60 hertz and 10k just as a smiley face that just gives it a little bottom and a little top. So without it, it just adds a, just a little more, a little more body to everything and a little more air and that's pretty all I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to kind of create any kind of sound from the two bus other than just enhancing the elements that are already there. For the compression on the drums, this depends on the track, but for this one, I went with the Distress. I usually do one or two compressors, either the Pro-L on the drums or the Distressor, depending on the type of music. And um, depending on what the sound is, for this one, it's a little more aggressive, so without it, and then with it, I'm only doing about a dB of gain reduction, but what it's doing is it's clearly adding um, just a grip to it, which I like, but it's not coloring it too much, and I don't want it to sound too pumped. Definitely don't want it to go there. Once I get the drums where I like them, for this kind of song, I'll go right to the acoustic guitars with the drums before I put bass in. Usually it's drums and bass, but since this is Colby's song, acoustic instruments are incredibly important with her voice. So I wanted the drums and the acoustics to be the shiners. So right now I have, as you can see, um, John Shanks played 
on almost all of these tracks. Maybe Justin played on some of them, but we've got high strungs, we have some ukulele stuff, and we have traditional six string. And right now, I, I have some very subtle EQ going on and stuff like that. And then on the feed down to the bus, I have another Poltec, which is just enhancing the top top end. So I'm going to take that off and I'm just going to play the acoustic by themselves. And this is what really makes Colby's tracks are these really pretty acoustic elements. I mean, the best element I can say for her music is acoustic fullness and thickness. It just enhances everything really well. Um, you got stuff like the high strung right here. Let me find it. So I have a little delay that just kind of creates a little bit more of a movement. But just on its own, if you just take these two acoustic guitars and play them. Um, this Kramer Pie is pretty cool. Even though it's a little older, it still has a character where it has some low mid thing that I don't know if in any other plug-in compressor really does. And I'm wondering how, like I've never used the real Pie in my life. I'm wondering how enhanced that really is with the real thing, which makes me really want to hear it. But if I take them off, and then add them, it just adds this kind of low mid thrust thing. It's very subtle, but it really does glue it together. And I actually like to use these EQs on acoustics. The top end of the SSL is interesting. It's not very clean, but at the same time, it adds this kind of, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, I, I like it on acoustic guitar and I like it on vocals sometimes because it's maybe just relevant to what I grew up listening to and it reminds me of specific records that I can hear the top end better than I can hear the low end. So I usually use it on acoustic guitars and um, on vocals. And let's just hear what this goes without. Here's another counter. This one had the LA-3, and I don't know why we had it. Maybe I was just experimenting. So the next thing I want to do is kind of listen to the acoustic guitars only and the drum set with the electronic set percussion bus. I'm going to solo these three elements, and let's just take a peek at what we got and see what our levels are at. I mean, right away, you can tell the track is... There's the meat, right there. Without bass, without synthesizers, without electric guitars, without background vocals, without vocals. And that's a Colby song. It's all about, you know, what you can kind of take with you on a beach, and then you add some filling and stuff like that for energy. But in reality, with the 16th note pretty stuff, and then like Vic's kind of rolling drum part, I mean, that's... That's the track. Electrics. John Shanks, master. Always has killer, killer tone. It sounds like I've got something panning hard, auto panning. Okay, so, yep. Yeah. So we've got a verse, a picky kind of chicken picky part. This is one of my favorite plugins. Auto pan. So it's it's pretty much a free plugin. It's a little different than the, the sound toy stuff. It's really easy to kind of make what it needs to do. Um, I have it just kind of going back and forth slowly and what it's doing is it's moving in and out. So if I just have the guitars You're getting movement, so when you have the drums and the guitars up by themselves... It's kind of moving back between the, the speakers, 
back and forth and it's kind of creating this movement. If I take it out, let's hear what it sounds like if I take out the panning. I don't know, it doesn't sound as good to me. It's another element that's random. It's creating randomness. So no matter what, if I come back for a recall, if I'm playing this now versus when we mixed it a few years ago, it's just, it's, it's gonna be different. And I like that. I like the fact that it's never the same. Um, let's see what we got on this other guitar. Okay, so two things, kind of my trademarks is if I have ever any, any kind of up picks, Motown style, I always put a spring on the hard right of if it's on hard left. So that's without the reverb. It's another element of stereo where you're having hard, hard pans and you're creating ambience on the other hard pan. So you're getting this pan law. And it's just another movement thing. Okay, this looks like Another Klanghelm box that I have, and it's adding a little bit of distortion. Now, the cool thing about this box, which is different than um, the Capitator or the, the Thermonic Culture, is it gives you elements to choose from. Different algorithms that are either the tube bus, a digital distortion, a fuzz distortion, or a desk, which sounds like transistor. And the cool thing about this, if I take it off, we can hear what it sounds like. Let me take the reverb off. It's great. It's a good tone. But I think it needed a little more juice, basically, without compressing and without actually, like, flatline distorting it. Let's just go through these and hear them. The tube is this. It's a little fuzzier. a little more pointed. Yeah, the thing with the tube algorithm, it's bringing out the actual natural spring from the amplifier. And then when you add the other spring, there's your stereo image. So that's pretty cool. Um, it looks like another third electric that I'm looking at that's coming in on the chorus. And let's just hear that by itself. Okay, so there's a ping pong going on for sure. This is a send I have. And it's ping ponging. Let's see what we've got for this. I don't know what delay that is. So it's just an H delay on ping pong. Another element of just circulating stereo it kind of creates this image. Once you put all of them together, there's just a lot of just movement, just with some effects and some delays. Not a lot of reverb at all, actually. So if we just did the percussion track, Pretty good, it's starting to sound pretty great. Let's talk about low end real quick. Bass, so with me, there's two types of bass that I like to get. One is like overpowering low, 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 low. And that usually sets the mix apart from other people. And there's two ways to do that. One is to emphasize your bus with a harmonic plugin like the B15 here, which I don't have on, but I can pull it up in my template and show you. This guy will fatten anything up super, super quickly, but it will also pulverize any kind of definition you have. This song, I kind of want to hear, I almost wish it was like a semi-hollow body, and maybe it is, but it, I needed to enhance that more. So what I would do 
is first I would find the low end, and if it's given to me like this, where it's the base and the DI, um, it's going to be a phase, give or take. So with the amp by itself, and then the DI. So when you sum the two, you're getting some of the fur, but you're not getting the low pocket. And this is before, let me take off what I've got on the bass chain. So what I like to do is, you know, obviously check the phase. Okay, so for this track, this is really cool. What it's doing is it's, off, it's putting it out of phase, actually. And most people wouldn't want to do that, usually. So without... It just sounds fuller, it's way deeper, but the thing is it's losing all your mids now. Your, your upper low mids, the stuff around 500, all that nice finger noise is gone now. But it's got all that rich sub stuff, which is basically shoving the bass way down below um, electric guitars and keyboards, which is all fighting in that low medium frequency range. So what I usually do, I'm a huge fan of just putting a huge point on bass. And as you can see, I do that. Uh, it's probably between 900 and 1200. And we'll see what we got. That's right at 1100k so without it you don't really got the definition there's your string now it just sounds wompy so you put a little compression on it and then a little bit of tape saturation Now it sounds like a, a like a semi hollow body. So without all the toys. And that's with the phase swapped on the amp. So with it again, I'm going to pull the drums in now. And let's hear what that sounds like with the drums and the bass falling in. Okay, so what it's doing is the drums are taking over a lot of the, the, the focus. So if you didn't have that point on the bass, you wouldn't hear it on speakers that are like the small speakers. Like, I'll give you an example. So right here we have this Bose speaker that I really like to use because in today's world, most people only use... Um, Bluetooth speakers or in headphones or smart speakers on their TVs, soundbar, stuff like that. And all these speakers seem to have this like enhanced low harmonic frequency thing that gets really tricky. And like in earbuds and stuff are doing it now where it's you have to be really careful with how you're hearing it because I'm listening on full range ATC 45s that sound fantastic. But when you're listening to it on something traditional from your TV or a Bluetooth speaker or anything like that, it tends to get really funky. So you have to add certain elements to kind of make up for it, which is why this boss box is really cool. It's still stereo, but it's all coming from an angle versus it coming from a split. So you're hearing things almost in a mono world. And for bass and stuff like that, you can just decide how much you're going to give off that. Um, I can't show you exactly what it sounds like, obviously, but anyone who anyone knows what these boxes sound like. So having one to check your mixes on is actually pretty cool. It's almost like a, an aura tone thing. But it's letting me hear that, like the, the finger noise and stuff. Okay, let's put the guitars and bass and drums together. Let's hear this.
Things are moving around. You can start hearing things kind of find their place. I'm not doing any automation actually on any of this I'm noticing because I didn't think it needed it. The stuff I was doing, the panning alone was creating this kind of pocket. We are into keyboards now. So let's look at what we have in this session. It seems like the road starts the song with the guitars and everything else. And then it goes to the first chorus, it comes into a second Rhodes. And then it goes into a second verse, the clav. And these are all John Shanks keyboards that he puts in himself. So all the keyboards and the guitars, it looks like, are all John's. So going into the second verse, there's a wah-wah clavinet. I don't really have anything on these plugins, and they're dumping into the key bus, and I don't have anything on that either. So clearly John had some great tones coming in, and we really didn't have to touch it too much. Maybe it has a tiny bit of top end lift from the ATR, which I like to use the high frequency, which I'll show you once we get down past the vocals. But in general, it just sounds like it's just clavs and roads going on right now. And then if we can take a peek at the synths. We have some arpeggios, some synth lines, a melody rhyme. But again, nothing is dumping. Nothing is on the two bus or the synth. So the keyboards and the synths are really clean. The only thing I see is this imager, and this is on a pad line. And let's find that real quick and see what it's doing. I'm assuming it's some kind of melodic piece. Let's just play it real quick. I'm assuming not. So it's just clearly synth part. But without it, it's a little, little tight. This kind of brings it out. It's a cool little box. It's a pretty old plug-in by Waves, but it definitely does some kind of phase element that actually widens the image quite a bit. So when everything's in it, it's kind of reaching out far with all the other elements, kind of nine and three. But I'm a big hard panner. As you can see, stuff are either all the way wide open or kind of focused on the others. So if you look at like my guitars and stuff, they're usually really hard left or hard right. And that just creates the kind of imaging that kind of creates that. So if we opened up the whole mix up to this point, drums all the way down to the synths, you can start hearing the track. Let's take a peek. Verse two. Take a peek at what it does with the bass. If I take the bass out of phase from the amplifier, it's gonna shift the low end back up to the mid range. So let's hear what that sounds like. See, that's another weird thing. So even though it was out of phase, it still feels like it's bigger and that's just really obvious when you play it with the full track how important that is that it's extending the octave down let's make sure we keep that on um, i want to talk to you a little bit more about my template and what i'm doing in terms of summing versus in the box and kind of playing you those two differences because now we're starting to have the song bit put together a little bit and you can start hearing what it's doing so let me talk to you about it. So like I said, everything is digital dumped into the stereo buses. And once I do that, I have it molted going to my in-the-box digital print bus, and I have it molted 
to summing on the SSL. I have going to this uh, JCF converter built by friend Josh Florian, phenomenal converter. It's super, super clean, but it actually has um, some vibe. In fact, I don't think it has any electronics other than makeup uh, transformers in it. So it's, it's just, it's awesome. That's all I can say, it's really cool. So having those go through it, it's going through the summing into the tube tech, which is the multi-band tube tech. I have that off now, and I'll come back to that in a second. But it's, it's returning with the JCF converter into my mix bus, basically. And that's dumping all of the, um, the, the, the stereo buses down from summing. And then it's coming back. And then it comes back and it hits this Ampex ATR, and then it hits this 560 EQ. And I'll tell you about this thing. So my friend Eric Boulanger uh, at the bakery uh, turned me on to just using this as an insert. And it's not really doing much as an EQ. And I'll tell you why I use it. And it's really impressive. The line amp is pretty cool because if you need to just add a little bit here and there, you can. Same with the EQ. If you just need to add a little bit, you can. But I don't really use it for that. I mainly use it just to actually hear the, the, the line amplifier insert, which in itself is awesome. It's its own color. So if, let me just do that real quick. I'm going to play this without, and I'm going to play it with. So let's just hear what this 560 does just off. And then we're going to put it on. Now I hear two things. I hear it giving a tiny bit of gain, but that's not what I'm hearing. It's, it's actually enhancing the stereo image a little bit and your center channel, your kick and snare are actually sitting in a pocket. Let's hear that one more time with and without. Very cool. So that's my stereo chain of my summing. But if you see here, here's my in the box, same print, and that's the clone. It's the exact same plugin settings. So if I go over to in the box, it's the exact same digital print as the summing. And this is for one or two reasons, and I'll tell you why. Sometimes in any kind of high velocity electronic or trailer or anything that needs a lot of sharp focus, I'll stay in the, in the box. I still think that it's king on certain elements. I actually like to hear both at the same time and toggle between the two once I'm setting up a mix before I kind of lock in with my compressor and stuff like that. So let's just do that. Let's just play what we have um, from the digital sends of the stereo buses down to uh, my summing SSL with a little bit of plugins and the in-the-box version. Well, let's go between the two. So here's the in-the-box version. And here is the summing. Backed in the box. Back to something. Okay. The two things I hear with summing is it's spreading it out a little bit. It's starting to loosen the collar a little bit where it doesn't sound as tight. I'm going to go back and play it and not talk. I'm going to toggle between the two. And there might be a tiny bit of a level difference, but really start listening to two things. Listen to the transient of the drums, the transients of the acoustic elements, and listen to how things are starting to carve out and spread out. And with all these delays and floating things, it's starting to become 
alive. And that's one of the elements of summing that I still think is king. But with the in-the-box stuff, it's sharper. So depending on the type of music, you could really actually use any one of the two, and they would be good. So let's go back one more time and just take a peek at in the box versus the SSL summing. Now, th again, this summing does not have a compressor on it. It's just coming out to the summer and coming back in through the JCF converter. So I'm going to start on in the box. Very cool. Glad I went to summing because it does have this sparkle element that I'm hearing that it's not doing on the in-the-box chain. Now I think we could probably pull up the compressor that I have on the two bus. And I have a tube tech stereo multiband, and this was turned on to me by Bill Schnee over 10 years ago. I remember when I was working under him, he had it, I never saw it before, and he had stuff going into it, and I'm just going, multi-band on a stereo that is insane i don't i don't know if that I, that's that's dangerous but i always noticed he was never hitting it more than a half db at the very most of all bands and so i ended up getting one and it's been really hard to take it off my bus as you can see i have quite a lot of other compressors and I just been sticking to this guy and I'll show you why because it's another one of those elements of aliveness where it creates this alive kind of flow because it's tucking stuff just slightly. So I'm going to play you just a second of the song again with and without the tube tech. to flow again everything is just slowly it's like a wave it's like an ocean i mean it's just creating a, a very alive spacious stereo image with it okay i think as a track itself it's sounding like everything is starting to sit really good i'm hitting the compressor about half db on my two bus Like I said, on this ATR, on this ATR, there's a repo high frequency that I can use as an EQ, and that just kind of sweetens things just a little bit. There is a sweet spot to it though, so you gotta be careful, it starts zipping if you don't watch it. So that's just kind of flat. And that's too much. Whatever I had on the in the box is a clone, so that's basically back to normal. Let's listen to this without it. my favorite, at least for this track. Uh, it's cool to kind of shuffle through and get little different EQ curves and stuff off the tape balance. Um, I don't really touch the calibration or the head type. I just keep it on one inch. It's the fattest you can get, so might as well go for it. This just seems to add another kind of sweetness sparkle thing. So when you start adding everything together, 
it just creates an image. And that's the biggest thing I try to get as bigger than life as I can when I'm going against any other reference or anything. I try to just make it sound as big as I can. So if it definitely sounds bigger than the ref, that's okay. So let's take a peek at what it sounds like without the compression and without these two plugins on their own. Because I started with them on, so we haven't really heard them without them. I'm going to play them. I'm going to turn off this tube tech and I'm going to just take them out. And let's just listen for a minute and just hear what it does. You see now that the drums are all put together with the elements that the samples actually don't nearly sound sampley as much as they used to. And a lot of that is because of the overall movement, everything is kind of covering. But it definitely helps having that attack and that punch where things are just coming in and out really pretty. All right, let's listen to the vocal. Let's talk about Colby's vocal. So. In my experience, in listening to the previous records that Ken's done with Colby and stuff, her vocal is always showcasing almost 80% of the track. In fact, there's a weirdness where the drums and the vocals are competing, but they're not fighting each other. And that was the biggest thing I've found with her stuff that's tricky. You know, I think it goes back to Ken's days with Fleetwood Mac in the beginning on the first two records that Colby did that brought in this very, you know, great rhythm element with her voice that really worked well. But her voice is kind of always needing to be there. And Colby's mom, Di, has been the gatekeeper for, at least for this record, of getting, making sure that every corner and every um, word is just absolutely in your face without it sounding too compressed. So I'm just going to open up this channel strip chain and see, just see what I'm doing. I don't think I'm doing a terrible amount. I like this guy a lot. This is one of my favorite vocal compressors, um, the Klanghelm. This MV2 is, I hate to say it, a secret weapon for at least Colby because that's where I started doing it and I saw on previous sessions of hers, this was on it. And what this does, it's, it's a very different type of compression plug-in where I think you're bringing up low information and you're bringing down high level. So you're kind of able to control those two types of things. But it really does make it sound like a record right away when you put it in. The Decapitator is just giving it a little bit of fur. I believe she tracked this on a U47 and it sounds excellent as is. And then a little bit of um, multiband on her voice DSing. I actually have two parallels of DSing, one on this and then one on the the output bus. And that just keeps her tucked while being able to get as bright as you can get. A little bit of delay. There's some automation delay and I have it called guitar delay because that's just what the delay was on my bus. And then at the end I have a little more EQ and again this is the SSL and that top band, going back to it again around 10k, it just adds this sound. I don't know what it is. It's kind of like a. It's not open. It's just it. It sounds like records I grew up in. I guess that's the biggest way I could think of it. If I knew any other angle, I would probably try to explain it. But I don't know how to explain that. Um, let's see what else. Hold on. Okay. So we have the delay on the voice, and then down at the, at the bus of the vocal, the lead vocal, I have the Bercasti, which I have the real guy set on Sunset Chamber, which is probably one of my favorites. And it's coming back here on a digital send. It's a digital I.O. And then it's cool, this M7 controller is able to control it via plug-in, so everything can be preset. The other really cool thing is, is right next to it, I have the 7th Heaven plug-in, 
which is a plug-in version, algorithm version of this guy. And what it does is it does its very, very good job doing it. So I can set this and this the same. And if I love this setting and I want it on background vocals in a little different decay or different pre-delay or whatever, I can just pull this up. But my main verb right now is the real Bricasti and it just seems to work. But if I wanted to use it on snare or whatever and I knew exactly the sound I want, I could actually dial it up with the hardware, use this M7 controller, which is virtually a plug-in at this point because it's digital I.O. and it's in and out. I just only have one instance. But it does make it make a difference. All right, let's listen to the vocal first verse. And then I can go through all the plugins and stuff and we can talk about it. If all I had was a dollar in your bright smile, I'd have a dollar more than I would need to get by. Cause I'm a billionaire if you count every sunrise. We can buy your side and every good night. If all you had was the way that I love you, you'd have more honey than the So this Clanghelm just taps a little bit, but it creates it from poking out too much. And it's very colored. I'm assuming this is supposed to be something like a stay level or something. And it does something similar where it kind of glues it together versus it grabbing peaks. It's just kind of just smothering it and kind of creating this thing. So the MV2. Let me pull the uh, MJUC up. This is the trick. This is a really cool plugin. It, it brings all the low level up and it keeps it tucked. And the multi band with it. Very first time that you kiss me in the sweet starlight of your endless eyes when you lit this fire feels like we're sitting on top of a gold mine flame so bright that it won't the decapitator is really not doing a ton other than like I said adding a smidgen of fur and let's just take a peek at this SSL because I wanted to show you what I meant about the top end being different. Because if I pulled up, let's just say, a uh, fab filter and set the, the settings relatively the same at 10K and, you know, a couple dB, I'm going to take it out and then I'm going to play this SSL. And relative, these are give or take about the same. But I want you to just listen to the two and just kind of hear what it's doing because it's basically, it's adding, the SSL adds this kind of, I'm not going to say electronic air to it, but it's definitely not as smooth as like a Poltec and it actually works really well for vocals. So the SSL by itself, here it is. If all I had was a dollar in your bright smile, I'd have a dollar. Now listen to the top of the vocal too. Because I'm a billionaire if you count every sunrise. And then here's the fab filter, relatively same setting. If all I had was a dollar in your bright smile, I'd have a dollar more than I would need to get by. Because I'm a billionaire. There's just way more air on the SSL. If all I had was a dollar in your bright smile. Oh, you, you can hear it on every come in on her vocal if all I had was a dollar in your breath and then here's the fat filter if all I had was a dollar in your breath it's just not as there so I like to keep that on the voice as much as I can when I need something that sticks through with a lot of percussion and stuff and the DSing is just just tucking that's the second one and it's just doing about 2 dB let's hear no backgrounds and just her voice with the track Keep you smiling, keep your dreams true. Long as I have you, I think we can do. Fly me back to the moon where you took me. 
Okay, so on the background vocals, it sounds like it's Jason Reeves and maybe some Nelly, which is Jason's wife, Nelly Joy. That sounds like Nelly and um, Colby. There we go. Back to the moon where you took me. The very first time that you kissed me in the sweet starlight of your end. So that's Jason and Nelly. Feels like we're sitting on top of a gold mine. Flame so bright that Again, it sounds, let me take this Brocasti off. Yeah, John Shanks and Colby and team really killed it on the backgrounds. They, they really, if you just solo everything up together. That's cool. So John Shanks producing this track with Colby and the gang. The, the, the background vocals itself, they're just, it's really great. Um, this track was super, super fun because everything was just there. The pockets were all there. Anytime there was a hole, they filled it with a vocal or acoustic lick or something that actually just made it constantly change. Here's the full track with everything. I'm going to listen at the bridge and decide. And I'm going to listen to the whole track with everything in at the bridge. I'm going to go back and forth between the in the box and this, and you can actually hear the summing versus the in the box. the rough again. Goldmine, Colby Carroll.